With seven Bond movies to his credit, he holds the record for the most films playing the suave secret agent. But that's only part of his career, which includes the TV series The Saint and The Persuaders, and more comical fare such as Cannonball Run and Spice World. Now he's taken his fame and used it for good, working tirelessly for children and UNICEF. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Moore, Sir Roger Moore. How did you find out you were going to be knighted? Oh, you get a, a letter. Do you have advance warning it's coming? Oh, yes. Well, you, you, you get an advance warning. The fir first thing, honor that I had was the CBE, which is commander of uh, the British Empire. That uh, you get two months warning, because if you're going to refuse it, Her Majesty does not want to be embarrassed. Right. By you sort of saying, well, I'm not coming, I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you write back and you say yes, <laughs> please, please. Then, then, and uh, then you two nights later you wake up and you say, "Am I really getting a knighthood? Really?" And then you spend a month thinking, "Well, it's not going to happen. You're not allowed to talk about it. You can't tell anybody. My wife, that was all. My wife and my assistant, they knew." I couldn't tell my children, <laughs> you know, because it's very bad. It, it did happen. Uh, yeah. It has happened in the past where people have spoken about it and thrown a party to celebrate, and they've not got it. Yeah. What does it mean to you to receive that, though? Well, it's, it's more a recognition of the fact of the, of the, the organization for which I work for UNICEF, uh, recognition of the fact that I have been working for them. But if that organization weren't there, who would I work for? How else would I help children? Yeah. Was it a dream of yours as a child to ever receive recognition like this? Did you want to be in the public eye? Uh, no. <laughs> no, you never said. Th I, th I think if you, if you walk around in life thinking I'm g you're going to get recognized for something, then nothing ever will happen. Yeah. Or you, you probably die before it happens because you kill yourself up with ambition. I have uh, so many, you know, friends, acquaintances on the they're not there anymore list who who died prematurely uh, because of ambition. Yeah. So I, I've never been ambitious, for which I'm very grateful. But then how do you work in the business you've worked in and not have that ambition and not have that drive? Uh, we have a, the, the drive to work is there because you, you have an agent, you've got a wife, and you've got kids that all have to be fed and a bank manager who <laughs> you would like to smile at you. Um, I was told when I started in the business that I, what you need is 33% talent, 33% personality, i.e. appearance, etc., and 33% luck. I think it's entirely wrong. I think you need 99% luck and half percent of the other. Yeah. Because if, you're, if you don't have the luck to be in the right place at the right time, it doesn't matter what talent you've got. Yeah. I know so many actors, so, so many great actors, who have not had any recognition as actors at all, not had any success. It's a lousy business, show business. Anybody sort of out there wants to go into show business, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Unless you have the attitude, well, what does it matter? Did you, going through all of this, and in the early years think about it in terms of, oh my God, it's not going to work? How or were you more of the attitude of, I'm just going to do the work and enjoy what comes my way? I've, I've been very lucky that things come my way. They may not come suddenly, but they do. You know, there is an old uh, sign on, on a Hollywood casting director's desk which says it takes 25 years to become a star overnight. <laughs> and it is true. It takes yeah. it's a long time, a long run. It's getting your knees brown. It's uh, having been out there, uh, being able to hook, take the rough. Yeah. When the movie The Saint came out, what did that say to you about the series you had done all those years before? 
the movie, the St. Valcomas movie, yeah. you mean? What did you say to me? Yeah. Incense that Don't trust Hollywood. <laughs> Boy, can they, mess it, can they mess up a good property. <laughs> but did it feel good to see that the work you had done, in a way, was being recognized all these years later by saying, this is something worth us re-exploring? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, television, all successful television series now have spin-offs into movies. Some are good, some are bad. There was an unfortunate one with the Avengers, which... <laughs> Uh, it was quite awful, and I think the Saint one was awful. Uh, it's going to be done again, by the way, the Saint. My my son is doing it with TNT. He's not playing the Saint, he's producing. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so they're, they're in preparation. Yeah. Probably on the screens next year. You also worked with Tony Curtis. Yes, that was fun. What was that like? Oh, great fun. Tony and I had, a, we had 13 and a half months together doing The Persuader. Sadly, it didn't work in America, I think, because ABC put it up against, on Saturday night, up against whatever NBC and CBS's top shows were. And we had, you, you can't come in with a new show and win. Yeah. Not with a successful one. If they were on the way down, then you stood a chance. But And so then they moved us, uh, I think, to a Wednesday night. I, I was very pleased, because I, I, a year was all I wanted to do of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I would not have been able to do Bond because originally I was doing Satan, I couldn't do Bond. Uh, and then I was doing The Persuaders and it, ca- and it came up again. And then all of a sudden I wasn't, and I could do it. Yeah. Do you look fondly back at the Bond films? Well, I had a great time. Seven, seven Bonds over 14 years. Uh, work, my dearest friend was Covey Broccoli, well, you know, one of the producers, mm-hmm. and finally was the producer, the, the, the one and only producer. Uh, wonderful man, a great, caring producer, and we had great fun. And working with that group, you know, every film you come back on, to, you'd be away for six months. You come back and it's like family, you're seeing all your old friends. Uh, easy to do. Yeah. There was a quote that I read that Noel Coward had told you when you were torn between the Royal Shakespeare Company or going to MGM, you should go for the money. Do you agree with that decision now? Well, absolutely. He gave, he gave me a few bits of advice. One uh, was uh, that, that was, it was that if, if you are ever, ever fortunate enough to, to be offered two jobs at the same time, take the one that pays the most money. He said, and always, always, always accept everything you're offered. Because if you're not working, you're not an actor. Ah. And then if you're fortunate enough to be offered two, take the one that pays the most money. The other one was take off a half an inch of hair for every year of your life. <laughs> I said, God, that must make your brain a very old. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know Noel Coward? Uh, I did uh, a play, This Happy Breed, with Coward in New York uh, for CBS, a special. I think in 1956, 56, 57, no, 56. Uh, it was a great, great experience. I'd met him before. Uh, when the opportunity came up to do this happy breed with him, uh, over the, he was very funny, hysterically funny. Yeah. Had a great, sharp, sharp wit, great mind. For the first uh, two weeks, he directed. And then we had Ralph Nelson come in as a technical director because Coward knew that the technicalities of television were beyond him but he really sort of did most of the staging of the first and, and what he liked Coward liked you to be word perfect on the first reading when actors usually sit around a table and read the script he wanted you without a script oh. so that was, that was no problem <laughs> I'd, I'd done the play a number of times I uh, played two of the characters in it when I had been at Rada at drama school and I'd done a production in, in repertory. So <clears throat> the adjustments they'd made to the television script was, was no problem. I was, came back from London, I, uh, and on the plane to New York, I'd, I'd learned it completely. And so I, I was okay. But when we... He liked things to go like this. And the girl who was playing Queenie opposite me I was very hesitant on her lines. She, uh, he suddenly got, 
got up and he stamped his foot. Listen, darling, listen, I have time to read a long book, finish War and Peace, do my knitting, drop into a deep curtsy, then you said you're like, get a... move on. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was, at that time, doing three specials. He did one with Claudette Colbert, and she was blowing lines all over the place <laughs> and came to the dress rehearsal and... Uh, and she said, oh, Noel, I am sorry. I knew the lines backwards this morning. So I don't want the bloody lines backwards. I want them forwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was great. He was great to work with. Yeah. When you were going into the Bonds, mm -hmm. w were you worried about the Sean Connery comparison or did you take it as something as a fresh start? How do you do that when somebody is recognized with a role and then it's becoming yours? Uh, well, you just go and get on with it. <laughs> Uh, the only time I had any nerves about it, I think, was after it. we'd finished shooting and I was on my way to London. The film was cut, put together, and I was on my way to London for the first screening for the press. And as I drove, I lived about 20 miles outside London. As I was coming into the car, I, uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Supposing I didn't like it, what am I going to do? Uh, and then... This wave of calm came over me. I said, you know, it's rather like uh, you're, you're going to have a baby. You're on the way to the delivery room. That baby's going to come out, good, bad, or indifferent. It's going to come out. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah. There's nothing you can do to alter it. It's on its way out. Uh, you just hope that during the, the pregnancy, during the, 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 um, that, that period, that you've looked after yourself, you've not been smoking, and you've, uh, you've eaten the right things and not been drinking. And so you'll have a nice, beautiful, healthy baby. Uh, so all during the filming, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so you say, yeah, well, you know, it comes out. That's it. You can't do anything about it. Yeah. Fortunately, they liked it. A lot of, of course, a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people just were sort of, you know, bring back Sean. Yeah. And I get that now. You know, I look at the, the things on the net uh, and it's, you know, this, they get down to this, who's the best Bond? People ask me who the best Bond is, you know. I say, Sean, of course it's Sean. Because <laughs> Sean told me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite film in the series? Of the, of the ones I made, I, I, I liked doing The Spy Who Loved Me Best. Why? It had all the right elements, I thought, of good entertainment as a Bond film had wonderful occasions, uh, but the important ingredient was the director, Lewis Gilbert, yeah. who is just uh, one of the funniest, sweetest, kindest men. And we'd, we'd laugh all the way through it. He'd say to me in the morning, yeah, you know, what are you going to say today, dear? And I said, what's the script say? He says, oh, we could do better than that. You know? <laughs> and, this, and this is the way we do And we'd shoot... Sometimes you get five or six tags for a scene. Yeah. Uh, and when we were filming in Egypt, uh, we were in Luxor, the temples of Karnak, and we had, you have to make a film in Egypt, you have to present the script to the authorities, you have to get permission from the government and the Ministry of Culture. Uh, you know, because Bond is very cultural. <laughs> and, uh, and you ha have it, and it's approved, you have a censor sitting on the set, you mustn't deviate from it. And so we're sitting there, and we did the scene, I don't know whether you remember the film, but I have a fight with Jaws, and finally all this stuff collapses around with all the columns in, down comes the scaffolding. And Louis said, I think you should say something, dear. I said, OK, I shall say something. And everything fell down, and I... And the sound man said, cut, 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 what did he say, what did he say? Can't hear him, we've got to go again. And Lewis was saying, shut up, shut up. And because what I was saying was Egyptian builders. I knew <laughs> I would say, and I would revoice it afterwards. Right. We, didn't need, we didn't need a guide track. <laughs> <laughs> got the biggest laugh in Egypt, my friends there tell me. Yeah. <laughs> but they were feeling sensitive about the censor. So I guess you were free to pretty much make Bond your own when you were in that series. You could bring your personality to the character? It, well, after, after the first one, there's not much they can do about it once <laughs> the camera turns over. <laughs> yeah. They've invested. The, well, there is the thing, they can't kill you. And that often used to worry me. 
that the, <laughs> the stunts would go wrong, and during the first few weeks, they, they yeah. would kill me. Uh, and then they would get all this enormous insurance money, and they could start again with somebody they liked. <laughs> and then, towards the end of filming, I, I started getting very careful, yeah. because then they had enough footage in the can to put a film together. You know, they get a double for long shots. Right. And they've got a finished film. They get the insurance money, and they've got the, the film. film. And then they can put a new one next time. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, it worked out. It worked out. I was very lucky. Yeah. When it came time to hand it over, to move on, to leave the Bond series, were you content with that? Were you ready to let it go? Uh, yeah, I knew that uh, I was getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, it was becoming love in the afternoon. Uh, it was a question of finding villains old enough to be looked as though they could be knocked down by me. <laughs> and, and leading ladies that weren't grandmothers, you know, if they were going to <laughs> You know, when, when you look down at a girl and you go, oh, these chins. <laughs> so, no, no, I'm a realist. Yeah. Did you have any idea who you wanted to carry it on, or were you pretty much going I, I'd way? actually uh, suggested both, you know, my, my thoughts were Timothy Dalton and uh, Anne Pierce. I thought they were both very good for it. I had read somewhere that you had not seen Timothy Dalton's work because if you didn't like his work, you didn't want to have to say not be honest in interviews. Is that so uh, true? Both. Uh, no, I, I just, I'm really, I've done them and I'm not really interested. And really, it's quite right. I didn't want to. So I have to say, oh, yes, they were all right. Right. <laughs> or, oh, I thought it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're both great. Yeah. Then I'm going to jump a bit ahead. You got very involved with UNICEF. I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate at the end of all that. I had uh, created enough uh, notoriety to be of some use as a spokesman for an organization yeah. um, such as UNICEF. What does your work entail when you work for UNICEF? What exactly do you do? Uh, well, you, there are a number of hats you wear. There's, there's, there's the one that you wear to go into the field, to go... Uh, into the developing country to go into projects to to visit hospitals to visit uh, water projects uh, to meet uh, the, the people working in the field to get the first hand experience so that when you come back you can talk about what you've seen with some authority mm -hmm. the other thing when you're in the field the other you've still got the same hat on but you can get into ministerial doors uh, and sort of try and push them into respecting the fact that they have ratified the rights of the child. Right. Which, incidentally, has been ratified by every country that was a signatory to it in the world, apart from the United States of America. Really? Which I think is something everybody should ask the government, why? Why don't you ratify the rights of the child? What do you think is the reason that we haven't? Well, I've been told of a various number of things that it's because there's such a uh, varied laws in the various states and we have things within the convention uh, when a child is not a child and also death penalty. Mm-hmm. Does it strike you funny, the recognition you get when you're out wearing that hat, when you're out working for UNICEF and in these countries where they recognize you as Bond, James Bond? Does that still tickle you a little? Uh, no, I'm very grateful they do. <laughs> I'm very grateful to <laughs> But going back to the other thing, you said, well, what else do I do? The other one is, one, is this what we're doing now, which is unawareness, uh, and the other is fundraising. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a very important aspect. Uh, it's an organization that requires a great deal of money to function. Uh, and I was asked a very good question by an American ambassador in The Hague a number of years ago. What percentage of every dollar raised actually goes to work for the children? And what percentage goes into administration? Because so many people, where they give money, they start having doubt about, is it all going? Well, the answer is that nine cents goes into administration, and 91 cents goes to work for the children. Also, 80% of UNICEF workers are in the field. 
when I started working with UNICEF, um, uh, we had the most uh, extraordinary executive director, Jim Grant. And he was a great, great example to me of what he did. And he was a man who, uh, we would be in the middle of talking, and he would just do this, reach in his pocket, and he would pull out the, you know what that is? No. You, you may look at that. You may get a close-up of it. You can't get a close-up of it. But anyway, there you, you got the, the cutaway of it. Well, that is oral, for oral, free, oral rehydration salts. If you, um, you have a child that's suffering from diarrhea, dysentery, they die from dehydration. They have to be rehydrated. And so this is mixed with water, and this rehydrates the child. It costs 25 cents. And I think the interesting thing is, say, you know, how important is it that this... I was in uh, Central America on my first uh, field trip, and I saw the way this was distributed. I saw what it did. I saw the way we taught women, mothers what to do if it wasn't available, mm -hmm. how they can do it themselves. And then I came back and I went to, into East Berlin. I went to a factory, a plant that produces this. So within one month, I've been from a place that uh, I've seen it in use, seen what it does. I have seen how it's made. I've seen how it's packaged. And I've seen how it's distributed. And at the end of the day, I have then gone to a fundraising evening to tell them about it. 25 cents can save a child's life. That's how important your dollar is. One dollar, four children's lives. That is amazing. So, it's a, it's a, I always think it's a very good prop. Yeah, <laughs> it comes love, in handy. I love I loved Jim Grant for doing that. Yeah. I don't always have it in my pocket. <laughs> it just happened this morning. I put this jacket on, and I remember I'd actually done a fundraising speech wearing this jacket. So then the work that you do with UNICEF and all that you've seen it do, does it trouble you, bother you, when you see the UN come under such scrutiny as it is right now and seeing the, the spin that they're, they're having with it? Uh, well, first of all, uh, UNICEF is a, uh, an organization working within the United Nations. We are not financially supported by the United Nations. We are supported by individual, gov by individual contributions by governments, Voluntary contributions, governments, corporations, and individuals. Uh, no money comes from the UN. The UN directives, of course, we work with WHO. WHO, they give us the statistics. They tell us that there are 48,000 children dying a day of uh, preventable yeah. uh, diseases. Uh, we need those statistics. Statistics in themselves are, are, are boring, they're cold, which is why I actually went out in the field because I had these statistics, and I said, I've got to see for myself. I've got the, the, there are no names, there are no faces. You have to go out and find them. And once you've seen those faces, there's no looking back. In some ways, has your career led you to be able to do all of this work? And do you look back at it in that way? Is this the important Oh, absolutely. Work? This is what I'm very, very grateful. My career has managed to give me a good living. And it's allowed me to be able to afford uh, to use some of the celebrity, the notoriety that I gained while I was being very lucky. Yeah. Just want to... Change gears real quick before we run out of time. Okay. Still skiing? Still loving the slopes? Uh, I have slowed off a little this year. I got sort of rather nervous about snowboarders. You, you find as you, you approach the twilight of your years <laughs> that uh, you don't want to be like it. It's, a little, it's more difficult getting up. And there are so many bad accidents today with snowboarders. I, I really don't like snowboarders. Yeah. Uh, they, most, most snowboarders have not learnt to ski. They don't know the rules of the piste. And I've been hit by a couple. Oh. And I get nervous about it. Yeah. As I understood it, when you started out 
and all of this, you wanted to be a painter. You were originally started in that area. Uh, yeah, yes, I, uh, from art school, I originally wanted to be an architect. My parents wanted me to be an architect. Uh, I then wanted to be a painter. I became a cartoonist. Do you still enjoy any of that? Do you still do any of that? Oh, I sketch occasionally and do cartoons. Yeah. You did an imp- apprenticeship at a... Uh, at an animation studio, correct? Yeah, I worked with a company called Publicity Picture Productions during the war. We made um, we made instructional films for for the army, for AK-1, for for fleet air arm fighter tactics. Um, I worked on the plans of the LCI landing craft for the Battle of Britain. Uh, it was, and I tell you, one one, one of the, uh, interesting things while I was doing that working at publicity production publicity picture productions we uh, had a technical officer come in to uh, advise on one of our films we were making called the 17 pound a gun and that was lieutenant colonel david niven <laughs> so i met my first movie star yeah and now and we made four films together <laughs> after that. and he became one of my dearest and closest friends well Thank you very much for taking the time to sit down and chat with us today. We are out of time. Thank you so much. (laughs) And I also am out of time. Yeah, (laughs) not at all. Thank you. (laughs) Sir, Roger Moore. Thank you. Thank you very much. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. Thank you.